Section 5 of The Complete Works of Tacitus, edited by Thomas Gordon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Complete Works of Tacitus, to which are prefixed political discourses upon that author. Edited and translated by Thomas Gordon, with introductory essays by Thomas Gordon. Volume 1. Discourse 4. Upon Octavius Caesar, afterwards called Augustus. Section 1. Of the base and impious arts by which he acquired the empire. By the death of the usurper, liberty was restored, but lasted not, and Octavius succeeded Caesar by no superior genius, by no military prowess, or magnanimity, for tricking and deceit constituted his chief parts, and though he was bold in council, he was a coward in the field. But he usurped the empire by methods so low and vile as brought disgrace even upon usurpation, by a thousand frauds and turns suddenly made, without the common appearances of decency or shame, by thousands of murders deliberately committed, without process or provocation, by multiplied treacheries, assassinations, and acts of ingratitude, by employing ruffians, and being himself one, and by destructive wars conducted by the bravery of others. He levied forces without authority, and, under a lying pretense of defending liberty, got to be employed by the state against Antony. He then robbed the commonwealth of her armies, and was thought to have murdered both her chief magistrates, the consuls, Hirtius and Pansa, the former by his own hand in the hurry of battle, and the other after it, by causing poison to be poured into his wound by Glyco, his physician. It is certain that the physician was suspected, seized, and even doomed to the torture, but was saved by the credit of his master Octavius, whose villainy had these farther aggravations, that he was generally believed to have been apathic to Hirtius for hire, and Pansa had ever a tender regard for him, a regard superior to that which he owed his country, as he manifested by the advice which he gave him before he expired under agonies caused by the hard-hearted contrivance of that his beloved and perfidious friend. With this very army of the commonwealth, he turned head upon the commonwealth, marched in an hostile manner to Rome, and sent a deputation of officers to his masters, the senate, to demand the consulship in the name of the legions, and upon some hesitation shown by that venerable body, one of these armed ambassadors laid his hand upon his sword and told them, If you will not make him consul, this shall. For his first credit with the Senate, he was beholden to Cicero, at whose suit he was trusted with command in conjunction with the consuls, and dignified with the title of propraetor. We see how he requited the Senate. We see how he served the consuls. And Cicero, his father in council, and the father of the Republic, he delivered up to be murdered and mangled by his implacable enemy. Section 2. Of the Vindictive Spirit of Octavius and His Horrid Cruelties In the battle of Philippi, Octavius was beaten out of the field, his camp seized, and, but for the fortune and valor of Anthony, the day must have been lost. After the victory, he showed as much insolence and cruelty as he had wanted courage in it. He could not forbear manifesting cowardly spite to the dead body of Brutus, before whom he had a little before fled for his life, and sent the head of that excellent person to Rome, to be laid ignominiously at the feet of the statue of Caesar. Different was the treatment shown by Anthony, who had saved Octavius and beat Brutus. Anthony beheld his corpse with grief and tears, covered it with his own armor, and treated it with respect and tenderness. Octavius had not greatness of heart enough for such generous humanity, but treated every illustrious captive with bitter words and cowardly insults, and put them to death without mercy, says Suetonius. To one of these, imploring the privilege of burial, the base tyrant answered, that the fowls of the air would soon regulate that matter. When the father begged mercy for his son, and the son for his father, the merciful Octavius commanded the father and son to fight for the survivorship. This barbarous fight he beheld. 
beheld the son slay his father, and then himself for having done it. Had not the remaining prisoners reason, when they were brought before Anthony and him, to salute the former with the honorable title of Imperator, and the latter with invectives and contempt? With the same cruel spirit he behaved himself after the siege of Perusia. All who applied to him, whether they pleaded innocence or begged mercy, had one and the same merciless answer. Death is the lot of you all, and they had it. Three hundred of the chief, comprising their nobility and magistrates, were carried in chains to an altar raised to Julius Caesar, and there butchered like cattle, as victims to his ghost, upon the Ides of March, the anniversary of his assassination. The city itself he delivered to the lust and plunder of his soldiers, contrary to articles and his faith given. Never was a more tragical and horrible scene. After killing, robbing, and ravishing, what the sword could not destroy, the fire did. And that great and beautiful city, one of the fairest in Italy, was reduced to ashes. There were historians who asserted that the quarrel between him and Lucius Antonius, who had shut himself up in that city, was all feigned, and a contrivance between them, for two reasons. First, to try who were real friends, and who were covered enemies, and then, by the conquest and confiscation of such, to find a fund for paying the veterans their promised largesse. From the citizens of Nursia he took all that they had, their substance and even their city, and sent them forth to wander and starve, for no other crime but that, for their fellow citizens slain at the siege of Modena, they had raised a monument with an inscription that they died for the public liberty, though he had but just before fought and declared for the same side. It is impossible to paint the horrors of the prescription. By it, every considerable man in the Roman world, who was disliked or suspected by the triumvirate, to disapprove their tyranny, was doomed to die. It was death to conceal or to help them, and the rewards were given to such as discovered and killed them. Many were betrayed and butchered by their slaves and freedmen, many by their treacherous hosts and relations, and many fled with their wives and tender children to the howling wilderness, and lived or perished amongst woods and wolves. Nothing was to be seen but blood and slaughter. The streets were covered with carcasses, the heads of the illustrious dead were exposed upon the rostra, and their bodies upon the pavement, denied the mercy of burial, other than such as they found in the entrails of devouring dogs and ravenous birds. This looked like dooming Rome to perish at once, and when the other two were satiated with so many butcheries, Octavius, who never had blood enough, still persisted to shed more. No sort of men escaped his cruelty, nor nobles, nor knights, strangers, nor acquaintance, nay, nor his confidence in favorite freedmen, nor even his old companion and tutor, Tyrannius. No one knows why, unless for being an honest man and a lover of his country. These victims continued daily for a course of years. The slightest suspicions, the vilest forgeries, were grounds for slaughters, for illustrious slaughters. Nor could the great quality and venerable station of Quintus Gellius the praetor, nor his innocence exempt him from the bloody hands of the executioner. Nor was execution the worst part of his doom. He was, by a band of soldiers, seized in his seat of justice, hurried away and subjected to the torture, like the meanest slave but confess nothing. Nor did all this injustice and barbarity satisfy the gentle Augustus, so much renowned for moderation and clemency. He had the brutal baseness to dig out the eyes of that magistrate with his own hands, before he allowed him the mercy of being murdered outright. One of his favorite ministers showed his sentiments of the clemency of Augustus plainly enough, upon the following occasion. That prince was judging some criminals, and giving himself over to revenge and bloody decrees, without check or compassion, when the minister, who abhorred to see him engaged in such feats of cruelty, sent him a note, told him, he was a butcher, and bade him, come down from his tribunal. Section 3. Of the Treachery, Ingratitude, and Further Cruelties of Octavius. That the same were wanton and voluntary. The conduct of Octavius in regard to Anthony was, like the rest of his conduct, all one train of perfidiousness. 
First he made court to Antony, then suborned rogues to murder him, then made war upon him with the arms of the state, then joined with him against the state, then by the bravery of Antony he conquered the empire, and then by plots and the valor of Agrippa he conquered Antony. Then he was devising ways to destroy Agrippa, and, but for an expedient offered by Marcanus, had destroyed him. Was it strange that against such a prince conspiracies were frequent? As he was a usurper, he could not escape some. His falseness and his cruelties begot others, and, from considerations public as well as personal, there was abundant cause for many. To punish one plot with exceeding violence is a sure way to produce more and when there is no safety found in innocence, further methods will be tried. It is a poor defense for Augustus to say that it was from necessity and to serve himself that he shed so much blood. For, besides that his cruelty was natural, wanton, and unnecessary, why did he seek to be in a station where acts of blood were necessary? Why did he usurp the state? Why did he make himself a mark for public and private vengeance? Was it not by ambition? Was it not by treachery that he assumed sovereignty? Was he not a public traitor? And was it not his choice to be so? Why did he willingly commit crimes so flagitious that in their defense he must commit more? Can one horrible iniquity efface another? Is a subject justified who, because he has deserved the pains of treason, raises a rebellion against his prince, nay, kills him to be safe? No villainy ever was, or ever can be perpetuated, which such reasoning will not justify. When some were bold and honest enough to talk to Oliver Cromwell about his excesses and usurpation, he asked them, What would you have won in my station do? He was well answered. Sir, we would have no body in your station. To vindicate murder from the necessity of committing it, in order to conceal robbery, is to argue like a murderer and a robber. But it is honest logic to reply, do not rob, and then you need not be tempted to murder. But if you will do one, and consequently both, remember that punishment does, or ought, to follow crimes, and the more crimes, the more punishment. If, by a repetition of crimes, you become too mighty to be punished, you must be content to be accursed and abhorred as an enemy to human race. You must expect to have all men for your enemies, as you are an enemy to all men. And since you make sport of the lives and liberties of men, you must not wonder, nor have you a right to complain, if they have all of them memories and feeling, and some of them courage and swords. Section 4. Of the Popular Arts and Accidents Which Raise the Character of Augustus Many things concurred to favor the same of Augustus, and to obliterate his reproach. He reigned very long, and established a lasting peace a special blessing and refreshment after a civil war so long and ruinous. For, though that war was the child of his ambition, yet in a series of ensuing tranquility it was forgot. Nay, the greatness of the public calamities was a reason for forgetting them. The generation who felt them were almost all cut off by them, and the next generation which had not suffered did not remember. What the people had not seen they did not lament. When he died, there were scarce any living who had beheld the old free state. The people, too, were deceived into a belief that they still enjoyed their old government, because their magistrates had still their old names, though with just as much power as he thought fit to leave them. It was the advice of Mycanus that to the officers of the state the same names, pomp, and ornaments should be continued, with all of the appearances of authority without power. They were to have no military command during their term, but to possess the old jurisdiction of judging all causes finally, except such as were capital. And though some of these last were left to the governor of Rome, an officer newly created by the emperor, yet the chief were reserved. Moreover, Augustus paid great court to the people. The very name that covered his usurpation was a compliment to them. He affected to call it the power of the tribuneship, an office first created purely for their protection, and as the strongest effort and barrier of popular liberty. It was for their sake and security he pretended to assume this power, though by it he acted as absolutely as if he had called it the dictatorial power. 
such energy there is in words. The office itself was erected as a bulwark against tyranny, and by the name of it tyranny is now supported. In the same manner he used and perverted the consulship. Another magistracy, peculiar to the commonwealth, but by him abused to the ends of his monarchy. He likewise won the hearts of the people by filling their bellies, by cheapness of provisions, and plentiful markets. This has infinite effect. If people have plenty at home, they will not be apt to discover many errors, or much iniquity in the public, which will always be at quiet when particulars are so. But famine, or fear of it, children crying for bread, mothers weeping for their children, and husbands and fathers unable to stop their tears, and find the necessaries of life for themselves, in such dear relations. All these are terrible materials for tumults, sedition, and even for revolutions. But people in ease and plenty are under no temptation to be inquiring into the title of their prince, or to resent acts of power which they do not immediately feel. He frequently entertained them with shows and spectacles, a notable means to produce or continue good humor in the populace, to beget kind wishes and zeal for the author of so much joy and to make them forget usurpation, slavery, and every public evil. These were indeed used for the ends of corruption and servitude. They rendered the people idle, venal, vicious, insensible of private virtue, insensible of public glory or disgrace. But the things were liked, and the ends not seen or not minded, so that they had their thorough effect. And the Roman people, they who were wont to direct mighty wars, to raise and depose great kings, to bestow or take away empires, they who ruled the world, or so directed its rule, were so sunk and debauched, that if they had but bread and shows, their ambition went no higher. By the same arts, Cardinal Mazarin began to soften and debase the minds of the French, and after his death the like methods for promoting the idleness and luxury were pursued, shows, debauchery, wantonness, and riot, were encouraged and became common, and after the restoration, England adopted the modes of France, her worst modes. There were some, too many, who, unworthy of their own happiness and liberty, came to admire her government and misfortune, and labored with the spirit of parricides, though without their punishment, to bring ours to the model of that. I cannot admit, observing here, that by the same means that Caesar and Augustus acquired the empire, they destroyed its force. In the civil wars, great part of the people perished, and the rest they debauched. They had utterly drained or corrupted that source of men which furnished soldiers who conquered the earth. Henceforth, the plebs in Genua became a mere mob, addicted to idleness and their bellies, void of courage, void of ambition, and careless of renown. Armies were with difficulty raised amongst them, when raised, not good, or apt to corrupt the rest. It was such who excited the sedition in the German legions after the death of Augustus. The recruits lately raised in Rome, men accustomed to the softness and gaieties of the city, and impatient of military labor and discipline, inflamed the simple minds of all the rest by seditious infusions and harangues, etc. Indeed, the Roman armies, so chiefly in name, were mostly composed of foreigners. To engage new creatures in dependencies, he created many new offices, as the multitude of offices in France is reckoned a great support of the authority royal. He raised many public buildings, repaired many old, and to the city added many edifices and ornaments. He attended business, reformed enormities, showed high regard for the Roman name, was sparing in admitting foreigners to the rights of citizens, preserved public peace, procured public abundance, promoted public pleasure and festivity, often appeared in person at the public diversions, and in all things studied to render himself dear to the populace. In truth, when he had done all the mischief he could, or that he wanted, and more, he ceased his cruelty and ravages. This, too, was imputed to him for merit. He was reckoned very good, because he begun to do less mischief. It was a rational saying of that madman Caligula, that calamitous and tragical to the Roman people were the boasted victories of his great-grandfather Augustus, and therefore he forbade them to be solemnized annually for the future. 
Section 5. Though Augustus courted the people, and particular senators, he continued to depress public liberty and the Senate. But amidst all these acts of popularity and beneficence, and this plausible behavior of Augustus, the root of the evil remained and spread. The bulwarks of liberty were daily broken down, and having lulled the public asleep, he was sowing his tares. The best of his government was but the sunshine of tyranny. Augustus was become the center and measure of all things. He was the senate, the magistracy, and laws. The arms of the republic he had wrested out of her hands. Those who had wielded them for her he had slain. The armies of the state were now the armies of Augustus. In every province, where legions were kept or necessary, he reserved to himself. Such as were unarmed he left to the senate and people. In kindness forsooth to them, for he studied to relieve them from all anxiety and fatigue, and to leave them nothing to do, but would take all the care and trouble to himself. Italy, the original soil of liberty and free men, he utterly disarmed, agreeably to the maxims of absolute monarchy. The Roman people and the Roman Senate he had reduced to ciphers and carcism. Hence all the submissions and duty formerly paid to the free state were, with her power, transferred to the emperor, and certain wealth and preferment were the rewards of ready servility and acquiescence. This shows that, however, he depressed the power of the Senate, he paid great court to particular senators, and it is too true that, as men generally love themselves better than their country, they too easily postpone the public interest to their own. Section 6. What fame he derived from the poets and other flattering writers of his time. The renown of Augustus was so notably blazoned by the historians and poets of his time, men of excellent wit, but egregious flatterers. According to them, Augustus had all the accomplishments to be acquired by men, the magnanimity of heroes, the perfections and genius of the deity, and the innocence peculiar to the primitive race of men. After so many instances of his cruelty, revenge, selfishness, excessive superstition, and defect in courage, after all the crying calamities and afflictions, all the oppression and vassalage that his ambition had brought upon his country and the globe, one would think that such praises must have passed for satire and mockery. But ambition, successful ambition, is a credulous passion. Or whether he believed such praises or no, he received them graciously, and caressed the authors. Hence, so much favor to Virgil and Horace, and to such other wits as knew how to be good courtiers. And hence, every admirer of those charming poets is an admirer of Augustus, who was so generous to them, and is the chief burden of their panegyrics. Suppose he had miscarried, suppose the commonwealth restored, and had him punished as a traitor instead of gaining the sovereignty, would not the historians... Would not the poets have then spoke as the law spoke? That law by which he had certainly forfeited his life? Would not Brutus and Cassius have then filled their mouths with panegyrics as the saviors of the state? Would they have lamented that the usurpation failed, and extolled the usurper? Is Catiline extolled, or are the usurpations of Cinna, Sulla, or Marius? Nor was the conduct and domination of either half so barbarous and tragical, is that of Augustus for a course of years. The truth is, their tyranny was short-lived, unsuccessful, or resigned. Iniquity, unprosperous or punished, no man praises. But wickedness, exceeding great and triumphant, almost all men do, as well as decry virtuous attempts defeated. Caesar and Augustus succeeded, and their flattery continued, because their government and race did. Sycophancy, is ever a constant attendant upon greatness, says Patriculus, who was himself a scandalous flatterer, and has in his history miserably perverted truth, or utterly suppressed it, that he might lie for the Caesars. When truth was treason, who would venture to speak it? And when flattery bore a vogue and a price, there were enough found to court it, and take it. Hence the partiality or silence of poets and historians. Section 7. Of the false glory sought and acquired by Augustus, from the badness of his successors. 
Another signal advantage to the name and memory of Augustus was the badness of his successors, and for his posthumous luster he was indebted to the extreme misery of the Roman people. In proportion, as Tiberius, Caligula, etc., were detested, Augustus was regretted. Yet who but Augustus was to be thanked for these monsters of cruelty? They were legacies by him entailed upon that great state, and he was even suspected to have surrendered the Roman people to the tyranny of Tiberius, purely to enhance his own praise with posterity, by the comparison and opposition of their reigns. He sought renown from a council, for which he deserved abhorrence. He had made a feint or two to abdicate the sovereignty. Had he been in earnest, he might at least have contrived that his usurpation should last no longer than his life, and have left for a legacy to the Roman people that liberty of which he had robbed them, that dominion over themselves which none but themselves had any right to exercise. The truth is, his power and name were dearer to him than the Roman people or human race. He made provisions by a long train of successors against any possible relapse into liberties. While he had no longer any heir of his own blood, or none that he liked, he adopted the sons of his wife, and even the worst of them was destined to the secession. If it is to be said that by such adoption he fortified himself, and considered heirs as the stays and security of his domination, this still shows what was uppermost in his views, that he meant to perpetuate slavery. If he had studied the good of Rome, why was not Tiberius, whom he knew to be tyrannical and arrogant, postponed? Why was not his brother Drusus, the most accomplished and popular man in the empire, preferred? Or, after his death, Germanicus, his son, one equally deserving and equally beloved? It is even said that he loved Drusus, loved Germanicus, and was suspected to have hated and despised Tiberius. Yet Tiberius was preferred, and had the world bequeathed to him. Was it done to please his wife? Then he loved her better than the Roman people, nay, preferred her caprice to the felicity of humankind. Drusus had declared his purpose to restore the commonwealth. The same intention is supposed to have been in Germanicus. This, perhaps, was the reason for setting them aside, as was said of Tiberius. Section 8. The Character of Augustus As to the character of Augustus, he was a man of sense and art, his courage below his capacity, his capacity below his fortune, yet his fortune below his fame, because his fame was the child of evil flattery as well as of propitious fortune. He was a cunning man, not a great genius, dexterous to apply the abilities of others to his own ends, and had ability enough to be counseled by such as had more. His designs were rather incidental and progressive than vast and conceived at once. He cannot be said to have mastered fortune, but to have been led by it. In the times of the Republic, he would have made but a middling figure, in the station and pursuits of Julius Caesar none at all. It is not in the least likely that he would have thought or attempted what Caesar accomplished. He wanted Caesar's masterly spirit, the eclat of the consummate warrior, his boundless liberality, his enchanting eloquence, for the eloquence of Augustus, which was easy and flowing, such as became a prince, was quite different from that torrent of language and power of speaking necessary to agitate and control the spirit of republicans, and came far short of the talent of Julius, who stood in rank with the most distinguished orators. I know not whether the vices of the dictator had not more popular charms than the virtues of Augustus. Caesar made his way to the throne. Augustus found it already made or where difficulties occurred was conducted by the superior lights and force of others, whom he rewarded with all the meanness of ingratitude and even cruelty, and did many things which the great heart of Caesar would have scorned. No great mind ever delighted in petty mischiefs, though to do mighty evil an elevated genius is not always necessary. Section 9. Of the helps and causes which acquired and preserved the empire to Augustus his great power and fortune, no proof of extraordinary ability. That Augustus acquired the empire is not a proof of talents grand and surprising. A thousand things concurred to it, times and accidents, friends and enemies, the living and the dead, thought and contrived for him. Caesar, Anthony, the authority of the Senate, the folly and corruption of the people, 
the eloquence and abilities of Cicero, seasonable conjunctures, the opposition of some, the compliance or intoxication of others, nay, the charms of Cleopatra, and his own treachery and fears. All these coincided to push him forward, and to hoist him into sovereignty. Nor, indeed, wanted he dexterity to improve opportunities, for he was a notable man, judged well, and had a turn for business. Nor did it require much genius to hold the empire when he got it. All who could oppose him were slain or subdued. He had armies and guards, and the people were disarmed and enslaved. The state was so thoroughly mastered, the Roman spirit so entirely broken, that any the most contemptible wrench among men, provided he were but vouched by the armies and called Caesar, might rule, insult, and lay waste the Roman world at his pleasure. What was Caligula? What were Nero and Claudius? Were they not monsters, who, but for shape and speech, were utterly disjoined from humanity? Yet were not these monsters suffered, nay, adored and deified, while they were wallowing in the blood of men, and making spoil of the creation? Nor were the savages cut off by any effort of the Roman people, but by the instruments of their own cruelty, their wives, soldiers, and slaves. Thus it was possible to be masters of mankind, not only without common sense and common mercy and compassion, but even armed with intense and settled hate against the race of men, and daily exerting it. The rule and havoc of a lion, or any other beast of prey, would have been less pernicious and less disgraceful to the Roman people, though he had required for his subsistence a vessel of human blood every day. Nay, had the imperial lion kept about him a court and guard of subordinate lions for his instruments and counsellors, they could not have been worried and devoured faster than the accusers, freedmen, poisoners, and assassins of the emperors. Cruelty, inspired by hunger, ceases when hunger is assuaged. But cruelty, created by fear and malice, is never satiated, nor knows any bounds. So much less dangerous and pernicious are the jaws and rapaciousness of a tiger than the jealousy and rage of a tyrant, his flatterers and executioners. Now where was the difficulty to Augustus? Where the necessity of high wisdom to maintain the sovereignty, when such despicable wretches can maintain themselves in it for a course of years? The Romans, who were masters of mankind, were become the tame property, the vassals and victims of creatures equal to no office in a state, even the meanest and most contemptible office. Creatures void of understanding, void of courage, such, without aggravation, were the lords of Rome for several successive reigns. Such, as were a scandal to human nature, trod upon the necks and wantoned in the blood of humankind, nay, delegated this work, and the disposal of the Romans' life and property to the vilest of their domestics and dependents, their spies, informers, and bond-slaves. End of Discourse 4